ready to true crime. Do, 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 do. Ooh. No true crown today, ladies. Ooh. What? What? Did what? We mixed it up with something else I want to talk about. Oh, oh right. well, hello. So we're not true crime. Your life story? No, that's boring. You actually wrote about Bobby's disappearance. He's dead, and I found his body. <laughs> wow. Anyway, no. Uh, By himself. <laughs> hey, let's open this the bit. bussy. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, Free Rotation Nation. Uh, I am this. Today, <laughs> <laughs> words. We podcasted for so long. Uh, How I do I so word so... it? Uh, I'm Chris, and I am here with our esteemed producer Angela. Hello, I produce something. Yay! <laughs> she she's won at least four Emmys. And our legal team, Emmy Becky. Rossum, Emmy. Need another name. Emma Stone. Bobby's still missing or dead or whatever in jail. Who cares? <laughs> so we've been doing a lot of the true crime and. Not even true crime necessarily, but maybe like mysterious deaths lately. Mm-hmm. So, keeping in line with that, I've decided to do something completely different again. <laughs> so, the hell with that. We're going to learn how to make jellies today. <laughs> that would be awesome, actually. <laughs> We're going to be jamming some cannons. What? We're actually going to talk about uh, Project High Jump, which mm-hmm. is I've been kind of interested in for a little while. So, after World War II, after 1945, the U.S. Navy basically decided they were going to have a program that went in... Not necessarily mapped out, but went and investigated uh, Antarctica to see if there was potential for a military base there. And uh, the idea was that they were going to name this base Little America 4. So they sent a, as an admiral, a rear admiral, I think his name, uh, I think he was a rear admiral, but his name was Bird. (laughs) So they sent him down there and a team to go do this exploration. And he was exploring the butt end of the world. I was about to say Rear Admiral. It took like at least 15 seconds for me not to giggle. Any (laughs) hoosles. So this was in 1947. Um, And again, two years, I mean, two years after World War II ended, we were worried as a nation, not so much about Germany anymore, but now it was Russia and the communist threat. So we were worried that they were going to try to get to us and we were trying to cut off avenues or build our own avenues, places where people hadn't before. So they went to South Pole brilliant he was down there for a few months they did their exploration came back it was they found places where they could build bases but it was pretty arduous because south pole fucking sucks most of the time i was about to say like i would not want to be little america for i wouldn't want to be living there what's what's interesting to me is this they were going to name the base little america four so i actually researched trying to find little america two and three which don't exist anywhere that i can find on google (laughs) it's that american education system for you well, I really think it does exist somewhere. We just don't know about them. I think they're mm-hmm. actually bases that we don't know where they're at. Because I'm sure the government, I mean, we know the CIA has, like, black bases and places where, I mean, it could be in North Carolina where they just go take people and torture them. Or it could be overseas. I mean, we don't know where those bases are, but we know they exist. So Right. Remember Conspiracy Theory, that TV show where he found one of those? Yeah. They, I mean, black sites exist all mm-hmm. around the world. We just don't know where it's they're It's just at. in the middle of big cities sometimes. Yeah. I mean, it could, it, it could be a room in a building mm-hmm. that you didn't know was there, that you didn't yeah. have access to. It's like Mattress Firm, where nobody, like, you always go in, they always stay in business, but there's, like, one guy in there at all times. That place is a drug front for the cartels, because uh, <laughs> nothing else makes sense. No one buys a mattress from Mattress Firm. <laughs> they have one gentleman and a room full of mattresses, but they, they're always in, like, really nice cities. So, like... The city next to us yeah. has one that I, in my job service, have never seen a single customer in there in the past 14 years. Not yeah, one. Yeah, just that random guy named, like, Roy, who yeah. just sits there he, all day. He's sitting there at a desk on a computer, not selling anything. <laughs> and leasing rates where this is are astronomical, so it doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, there's no way that place is just losing $30,000 a month and staying in business. That's true. I mean, I guess you could, yeah, it's true. I mean, it has to be a front for something. I assume the cartels. They're just... Never seen... I think we went into a mattress firm. Did we buy our mattress from mattress firm? Mm-mm. It was the sleep by number, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No yeah. one ever does. <laughs> it's just there. That's the whole point. It's all a lie. So, I assume Little America 2 and 3 exists somewhere. Maybe one's on the moon. I doubt it, because this was before the moon landing, or so they tell us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not a moon landing denier. I'm a timeline denier. They did it way earlier than 69. No. Um, nice. 
so their plan was to go down there, and he was down there from, um, and they, they sent ships and then to kind of get the outline of where they could land, and then they took planes and were supposed to fly over to the dead center of South Pole, mark it, fly back, see if it was hospitable, I guess would be the right word, for having a, ba- a military base down there. Surprise, it's not. Oh, it's shocking. Yeah, it's the Antarctic. It's there's enough, There are no penguins. It's, it's just awful. It's just cold. <clears throat> just Yeah, we have, like, scientific bases down there, but even then they stay for, like, a few months and then leave because mm-hmm. it's just that awful. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's really meant to be habitable unless you built, like, a super dome, had artificial light, all that different stuff, central heating and air. And air. And air. <laughs> we don't need We it. don't need any more air. It's just a pipe that runs outside. <laughs> 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 Can you just picture it? Like that one person who's like, oh man, I'm a little chilly. As so they step outside for 15 seconds, they're like, I'm good now. <laughs> I'm good. Real, real cool. You good now, bro? <laughs> I'm an ice cube. <laughs> so. Chris just patiently waited <laughs> no, for yeah, us. Yeah, they actually, uh, in the Bay of Wales in the South Pole, they actually did send troops and building materials to start building Little America 4. In February of 47, they terminated this plan because the winter was just too harsh for human beings and decided that we could not have a base there. Okay. Um, Makes sense. Admiral Byrd, or Rear Admiral Byrd, um, he actually issued a statement after this trip. And this is all U.S. government funded. Admiral Richard Eber, and I'm going to read this specifically from what the newspaper said. He said, so this is a direct quote. Admiral Richard E. Byrd warned today that the United States should adopt measures of protection against the possibility of an invasion of the country by hostile planes coming from polar regions. Huh. The Admiral explained that he was not trying to scare anyone, but the cruel reality is that in the case of a new war, the United States could be attacked by planes flying over one or both poles. The statement was made as part of a re- recapitulation of his own polar experience in an exclusive interview with the International News Service. Talking about the recently completed expedition, Bird said that the most important result of his observations and discoveries is the potential effect that they have in relation to the security of the United States. The fantastic speed of which the world is shrinking, recalled the Admiral, is one of the most important lessons learned during his recent Antarctic exploration. I have to warn that my, co- com- my compatriots that this time has ended where we were able to take refuge in our isolation and rely on the certainty of the distances, the oceans, and the poles were a guarantee of safety. So basically, after all this, when they decided that it's not habitable, ha- hospitable for people, that you can't have a base there, he still came out and said, yeah, there, someone can definitely attack us from the poles. Okay. Which is mm-hmm. confusing at best. Well, and wasn't it around the same time that they found that Germany had gone and staked out some sites there? Uh-huh. Well, yeah. they know the Germans had been interested in the poles for a while. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of when they put the thing that nobody can own in Antarctica. Antarctica is its own yeah. place. But that was Operation High Jump. Basically, they sent him down there with some planes and some ships to see if you could have a base. He said there are some places where you could potentially build a base. They tried it and decided, oh, yeah, it fucking sucks down here. Never mind. <laughs> Bird still comes out and says, we have to worry about the poles, even though apparently we can't build there <laughs> and stay there. So, super not normal. After High Jump ended, there was another operation that was called Windmill that was basically to go down there. And that one was more of a map making expedition to kind of map out the coastline and kind of see how it looked right yeah windmill was basically like okay he said we could do this but we clearly can't why right so they went down there and tried to map it out um they didn't have a problem mapping it again they've had maps of antarctica since the 1500s which is confusing to most people can you imagine like the people who are like in the 1500s going down there like oh it's getting a little chilly well, it's tippet nippily down here when you're talking about like the the 1500s maps that were made from older maps yeah they're not even sure how those existed because no they don't they don't think we as human beings had the ability to sail into the antarctic in no wooden ships back then yeah but then you get into the whole Sea King conspiracy and the fact that, like, you know, there are South Americans that have weird genetics that are come from Russia and mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Well, and it's just like uh, we, we found out at Fernbank that time that it's literally just a, a, a like, a motorboat ride yeah. to Antarctica from the very tip of South America. But even then, it's not great. In, uh, in a wooden ocean, ship. <laughs> well, that and ocean-wise, right. the currents suck because they're... Yeah. When you think about, like, wind whipping around a building... And you feel Wind's it super hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Imagine it with like huge land masses and there's a small patch. Yeah. It's and a, there's ice all in the water. Yeah, a giant yeah. channel of just yeah. whoosh. 
So sailing ships down there is not great to the point of where, rather than do that, we cut a line through Panama and flooded it. <laughs> because that was a way better plan yeah. than floating yeah. around. Yeah, you know what? Right. Yeah, I mean, fuck this shit. We're just going to cut yeah. the earth. Thanks mm-hmm. for your land. We're taking it and building a pass <laughs> because that shit sucks. Yeah. I mean, that's how much it's not great going around. Uh, is that Cape of Good Hope? No? Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, Cape Horn yeah. or something in Africa. Yeah, it's... When you go around huge land masses like that with the water that's current, it, it just sucks. And, again, rather than do that, we spent trillions of dollars digging chunks of land out of the way that made it easier. Mm-hmm. And then defending it. Yeah. Before it was, we were like, hey, here's your land back. What? Sort of. Sort of here's your land back. Yeah. We you can have it on paper. Here's the yeah. air. <laughs> we own it, and we're going to let you live near it. <laughs> it's yours yes. we we control the locks we control the canal we control the traffic through it and probably mm-hmm. i don't know a couple our canal yards. your land <laughs> yeah. yeah but yeah so again we didn't think the old old school and i say real old school hundreds and hundreds of years ago sailors could do that but antarctica had been mapped out so at some mm-hmm. point someone was able to make that trip and apparently the entire coastline because they had the whole coastline they mapped out, which is bananas crazy to me mm-hmm. that these maps existed. Because you also couldn't just, oh, let's just go fishing and get some food. Well, apparently, not just that, but the distances are right on those maps. So, like, I get that they could measure uh, leagues and length, and mm-hmm. but getting the, the coastline mapped out to the correct proportions, even within a few feet, is insanity to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and there's a theory, an old theory, that they were able to do it because way back when there was a bridge that went across, because it's, whether it's a land bridge or some sort of bridge, because yeah. you can see it under. Yeah, again, I don't think Antarctica was always frozen. It wasn't always a wasteland. Yeah. However, it's still crazy to think Yeah. in the 1200s, 1100s, 900s, mm-hmm. they were whipping around there with boats like, hey, Let's go make a map of this joint. Yeah, which is also why it's wild that they found pyramids there and all those doors and, and shit, which, you know, everybody says conspiracy, but no, that's real. So I don't I don't think it's a conspiracy. I've seen the pictures. Mm-hmm. Definitely, they could say it's a mountain range. Definitely looks like a damn pyramid. It a is, fucking door inside it is, of it. It is pretty four-sided and very triangular. Really mm-hmm. looks like a pyramid. Yeah. And again, we've been to the mountains here. They don't look like that. I was about to <laughs> yeah. say, too, though, if you think about it, like, it's not, an, it, to me, it's not out of the possibility because we went through a little ice age, what, two, three hundred years ago. Things refroze. It's very possible that Antarctica used to be a lot fucking warmer than it is now. Well, North America used to be the Sahara. Yeah. Not not the desert, but, you know, with lions. And that really blew yeah. my freaking mind when I found out we used to be the, you know, the plains where the lions and giraffes lived. So it's very possible the land just looks we, very different than what it used to. There were North American camels. The dromedaries were here. Yeah. Uh, most of where we live in Georgia, uh, about an hour and a half south of us, was all underwater. It was all ocean. Yeah. I mean, once mm-hmm. we get down to the Macon line, it goes from red clay to sand because that was all underwater. Yeah. yeah. You find shark's teeth and shells in farmer's fields. In, I mean, you're 200 miles from the ocean. Mm-hmm. And you theoretically, I mean, what we have is theories and ideas of what it is. Until it's disproven later down the line, we only know what we know now. So we only know what yeah. what existed at the time. I was reading this thing and it said, you know, essentially Florida is a big floating dock because you could dive and go through systems and come out the other side if you had that much air. Yeah. And I just what was it, blew like my Ocala freaking... in the middle of Florida yeah. that apparently just bleeds out? Yeah. Yeah, and goes to the... Yeah, like, coast. what? It's just a floating dock. Yep. <laughs> Hit it too hard and it just... Well, I mean, it's, if we get too much ocean rise from, you know, yeah. climate change... It's gone. Florida's under a lot more water. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's now just... it's a modern-looking panhandle. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just but... a slim design. <laughs> it's just a line at the bottom of Georgia. Yeah. Well, you can just walk it. Yeah. Like, it's a single-file line. Do you, oh, God. do you live in South Georgia? Now you have beachfront property. Enjoy. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I live in Macon. Oh, I could buy beachfront property in Macon. That's so nice. Yeah. It's just water world. It's paper. But yeah, so they had these maps back when. So we know that it's been mapped before somehow. Whether it was, you want to get into astronaut, ancient astronaut theories or sea kings or whatever. None of it makes good sense, but it does exist. 
Yeah. Which is whatever. That was what Bird was sent down to Antarctica for. After World War II, make sure that we couldn't be attacked from the south. We couldn't build a base there because it was a nightmare. He still said, hey, we could still be attacked from the south. Take mm-hmm. you. Which is the, very off-putting. It's confusing. So a few years ago, and I say like, this is like 93, supposedly, and again, this is all taken with a grain of salt because there's no way to prove or disprove it. There was a diary that Robert Byrne had written that was released. That yeah. they found in his personal His notes. diary is cuckoo. You th- you would think you're reading a fiction. Oh, I'm going to read it. I have it yeah, printed. Oh, I have cool. parts of it printed. Oh. So this is my favorite part because it gets batshit insane. I was hoping you were going to read it. I it's did. Good. It's fun. It's so, a mystery. Because I don't think you... I don't know what this okay. is at all. Let's like, go. I've never heard okay. of any of this other than Antarctica okay. itself. So I'm going to read literally from the book, which may or may not be his diary. All right, so so I'm going to read excerpts from his diary or what the... Again, I'm not saying this is real because I don't know. I don't know how to prove it. Right, because the military and all, they're like, oh, yeah, he kind of lost it. He got cold. Like, yeah. you, you lose it. So who knows? So we're going to read some excerpts from his diary, and you guys can take this however you want because it gets... I take it as bona fide 100% fact <laughs> truth. <laughs> I am going to reserve my ruling until I hear it because I have no clue what you're about but to read. But keep in mind, he was picked because he was so good. He was yeah. a rear admiral. We're not talking about like sergeant. He's not even the front admiral. He's the rear yeah. admiral. He, he's not like he's sergeant, you know, fanny pack Magoo. He's, you know. This is a respected man. Also, yeah. my new screen name for Valorant is Sergeant Fanny Pack Magoo. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready, I'm ready. So we're going to read the excerpts from his diary, which I have no six pages of, but it's fun. Okay, okay. All right. And this is all in Robert Byrd's handwriting. I must write this diary in secrecy and obscurity. It concerns my Arctic flight on the 19th day of February in the year of 1947. There comes a time when the nationality of men must fade into insignificance and one must accept the inevitability of the truth. I am not at liberty to disclose the following documentation at this writing. Perhaps it shall never see the light of public scrutiny, but I must do my duty and record here for all to read one day. In a world of greed and exploitation of certain of certain of mankind can no longer suppress that which is truth. Flight log, base camp, Arctic, 2 1947 600 hours. All preparations are complete for our flight northward, and we are airborne with fuel fuel tanks at 610 hours. 620 hours. Fuel mixture on starboard engine seems too rich. Adjustment made, and Pratt Whitney's are running smoothly. I assume the Pratt Whitney's are the motors. The yeah, engines. yeah, engines. 0730 hours. Radio check with base camp. All is well, and radio reception is normal. 0740 hours. Note slight oil leak in starboard engine. Oil pressure indicator seems normal, however. 0800 hours. Slight turbulence noted from easterly direction at altitude of 2321 feet. Correction to 1700 feet. No further turbulence, but tailwind increasing. Slight adjustment in throttle controls. Aircraft performing very well now. 0815 hours. Radio check with base camp. Situation normal. 0830 hours. Turbulence encountered again. Increased altitude to 2900 feet. Smooth flight conditions again. 0910 hours. Vast ice and snow below. No, uh, no coloration of yellowish nature and disperse in a linear pattern. Altering course for a better examination of this color pattern below. Note reddish or purple color also. Circle this area full two turns and return to an assigned compass heading. Position check made again to base camp and relay information concerning colorations on the ice and snow below. So again, he's been flying for three hours over Antarctica. After three hours, they start seeing weird colors in the snow. Okay. Yellows, right. reds, purples. O nine ten hours, both magnetic and gyro compasses beginning to gyrate and wobble. We are unable to hold our heading by instrumentation, take bearing with sun compass, yet all seems well. The controls are seemingly slow to respond and have sluggish quality, but there is no indication of icing, which I assume as you get closer to the poles, the magnet. compasses and yeah. stuff kind of get yeah. screwed. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah because of the word, me. well, I mean, it's mm-hmm. the polar. Yeah, yeah it's you're the getting poles. close to a, a magnetic pole. That right. would seem right. That's why you also have, you know, a, a protractor and an actual compass. Yeah, not a sun magnet. compass. Yeah. Like, we can measure this by which mm-hmm. way we need to go. Yeah. So, 0915 hours, so it's been five minutes. And the distance is what appears to be mountains. 0949 hours. 29 minutes have uh, elapsed flight time from the first sighting of the mountains. It is no illusion. They are mountains and consist of a small range that I have never seen before. 0955 hours. Altitude changed to 2950 feet, encountering strong turbulence again. 
uh, 1,100, 10, so 10 o'clock. 1,100 hours. We are crossing over a small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best as can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side are great forests growing to the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. Did he end up in the Feywild or something? 10.05 hours. Well. I alter altitude to 1,400 feet and execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green and with either moss or a type of tight-knit grass. The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another full left turn and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible, yet there it is. Decrease altitude to 1,000 feet and take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed. It is definitely a mammoth. Report to base camp. Right. And keep in mind, like, over the centuries, people have thought the dinosaurs went to the poles. Right. Or at least wherever, if there were dinosaurs somewhere, they weren't completely extinct from our area. Yeah. Because I think, the, I think the actual asteroid hit North America. But there's yeah. always been a thought it, it process. It hit by Maryland and the Chesapeake. Yeah. But they've always said, like... The one that killed the dinosaurs? Yeah. Hitting the... Yucatan Peninsula, the big one down mm. in Mexico. Right. Like, that's what I'm saying. So it was in North America. But a lot of people have said before that, um, like, if another asteroid ever hit us, humanity wouldn't be completely wiped out. There would always be yeah, some. there's pockets. There's well, pockets of humanity that would survive. You look at the Lesser Drives and the Halcyon Comet event that happened about 13,000 years ago. Um, basically, it covered North America. It caused a little ice age, but it covered North America in about a mile and a half of ice. Uh, that's what killed off the, when we say we used to have short-faced bear and mm -hmm. camel and uh, lions. And that's the one that hit in the Chesapeake the, or it, the one over it, it Arizona? In Canada. Oh, Canada. Um, and that's why you have like the Badlands in Montana, North Dakota mm -hmm. and all. That's all the from the, the ice. Slide. Yeah. But it covered North America in about a mile and a half of ice. So if there were things here, they got kind of destroyed. Yeah. Uh, and again, mm -hmm. I, I look at that with, if there were cities here, there could have been I mean, vast cities. Yeah. Made of metal structures and huge skyscrapers. Yeah. And you're not standing up to that ice. A mile and a half of slow moving ice yeah. grounds you into nothing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. literally out of existence. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can't stop it. It's, no. It's inexorable. But that's what killed all the megafauna and the megaflora in North America. Right. Mm -hmm. 13,000 years. So it is kind of believable that maybe other things survived. Mm. And as these things hit, they tilt. We don't just like. Continuously, yeah, yeah, there is, yeah. I mean, we're throwing they a knock us out of our kilter. orbit. Yeah, there's, I mean, shock. Wasn't there an earthquake a few years ago that yeah, was so that hard that it us. tilted us even further? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's why they say the zodiac switched a little. Yeah. All right, so we're at ten thirty hours, encountering more rolling green hills. Now the external temperature indicator reads seventy four degrees Fahrenheit. Continuing on our heading now, navigation instruments seem normal. I am puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. So 10, 11, 30 hours. I've been flying for another hour. Countryside below is even more level and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead we spot what seems to be a city. Impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. Off our port and starboard wings are sh a strange type of aircraft. They are closing rapidly alongside. They are disc-shaped and have a radiant quality to them. They are close enough now to see the markings on them. It is a type of swastika. This is fantastic. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We are caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. So, they now have UFOs with swastikas on the side of them. Huh. Coming up. Not aliens. Well, remember, we had it. And, and listeners, you may remember we had an episode about a, a series on Hitler and the occult. Where and again, it may not have been Nazi swastikas. That's just. Yeah. Could've well, you, you remember the old school pagans had a yeah. uh, quote-unquote swastika. Hindis. Everybody confuses yeah. the pagan good luck and good fortune with swastika. Because mm -hmm. it's a swastika. 11, yeah. 11.35 hours. Our radio crackles and a voice comes through in English with what perhaps is a slight Nordic or Germanic accent. The message is, welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral, you're in good hands. I note the... Engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. The controls are useless. 1140 hours. Another radio message received. We begin the landing process now, and in moments the plane shudders slightly and begins a descent as though caught in some great unseen elevator. 
the downward motion is negligible, and we touch down with only a slight jolt. 11.45 hours. I am making a hasty last entry into the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot towards our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a large shimmering city pulsating with rainbow hues of color. Now, Becky, do you know what this sounds like? It sounds like Asgard. It sounds like Tuatha. Or Tuatha. I mean, to me, or it the, sounds... Who were the ones that were opponents of the Tuatha? The F- starts with the F. Frogdian, Freddians. I don't know what the, the Tuatha are. The Tuatha were fairies. That, well, it's they were the ancient people that basically the who prophesied the spear of destiny and all these pieces would make you. Yeah, the Tuatha. They're kind of like your um. If you were to com- consider them, they would be like the Nephilim and angels, like of the old. They were school the bio. first people. They were the first people, basically. Yeah. But they had opponents who wanted to mechanize weaponry, and um, the Tuatha had like uh, weapons that were made of this. The Fomorians. Yeah, that's it, the Fomorians. Yeah. It actually sounds like the Fomorians. Yeah. I do not know what is going to happen now, but I see no signs of weapons in those approaching. I hear now a voice ordering me by name to open the cargo door. I comply. End log. From this point, I write all the following events here from memory. It defies the imagination. It would seem all but madness if, I, if it had not happened. The radio man and I are taken from the aircraft and are received in a most cordial manner. We are then boarded on a small platform-like conveyance with no wheels. It moves us toward the glowing city with great swiftness. As we approach, the city seems to be made of crystal material. Soon, we arrive at a large building that is a type I have never seen before. It appears to be right out of the design board of Frank Lloyd Wright, or perhaps more correctly, out of a Buck Rogers setting. We are given some type of warm beverage that tasted like nothing I have ever savored before, but it was delicious. That sounds to me like, not just to off, I mean, that sounds like, but that also sounds like, like Norse mythology, like all the way around. Like the mead and stuff like that? After about ten minutes, two of our wondrous appearing hosts come to our quarters. Just keep listening. uh, And announce that I am to accompany them. I have no choice but to comply. I leave my radio man behind and we walk a short distance and enter what seems to be an elevator. We descend downwards for some moments. The machine stops and the door lifts silently upward. We then proceed down a long hallway that is lit by rose-colored light that seems to be emanating from the very walls themselves. One of the beings motions for us to stop before a great door. Over the door is an inscription that I cannot read. The great door slides noiselessly open and I am beckoned to enter. One of my hosts speaks. Have no fear, Admiral, that you are in audience with the Master. Huh. <laughs> I step inside my eyes adjust to the beautiful coloration that seems to be filling the room completely. Then I begin to see my surroundings. What greeted my eyes is the most beautiful sight of my entire existence. It is in fact too beautiful and wondrous to describe. It is exquisite and delicate. I do not think there exists a human term that can describe it in any detail with justice. My thoughts are interrupted in a cordial manner by a warm, rich voice of melodious quality. I bid you welcome to our domain, Admiral. I see a man with delicate features and with the etching of years upon his face. He is seated at a long table. He motions me to sit down on one of them. After I am seated, he places his fingertips together and smiles. He speaks softly again and conveys the following. We have let you enter here because you are of noble character and well-known on the surface world, Admiral. Surface world. The surface world. Ha! Oh, wait. The start of Middle Earth. I was about to say. No, it really is. No, I was about to say. This sounds like Rivendell. No, this is where people started thinking that Hollow Earth was actually legitimate. I half gasp under my breath. Yes, the Master replies with a smile. You are in the domain of the Ariani, the inner world of the Earth. We We shall not long delay your mission, and you will be safely escorted back to the surface... And for a distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Our interest be- rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was the it was at that alarming time that we sent our flying machines, the Flugelrads, to your surface world to investigate what your race had done. That is, of course, past history now, my dear Admiral, but I must continue on. You see, we have never interfered before in your race's wars and barbarity, but now we must. For you have learned to tamper with certain power that is not from man, namely of that atomic energy. Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of the world, and yet they do not heed. Now you have been chosen to witness here that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science are many thousands of years beyond your race. I interrupted, but what does this have to do with me? The master's eyes seemed to penetrate deeply into my mind, and after studying me for a few moments, he replied, Your race has now reached the point of no return, for there are those among you who would destroy your very world rather than relinquish their power as they know it. I nodded, and the master continued. 
1945 and afterward, we tried to contact your race, but our efforts were met with hostility. Our flugel rods were fired upon. Yes, even pursued with malice and animosity by your fighter planes. So now, I say to you, my son, there is a great storm gathering in your world, a black fury that will not spend itself for many years. There will be no answer in your arms. There will be no safety in your science. It may rage on until every flower of your culture is trampled and all human things are leveled in vast chaos. Your recent war was only a prelude of what is yet to come for your race. We here see it more clearly with each hour. Do you say I am mistaken? No, I answered. It appears it happened once before and the Dark Ages came and they lasted for more than 500 years. Yes, my son, replied the master. The Dark Ages that will come now for your race will cover the earth like a pall. But I believe that some of your race will live through the storm. Beyond that, I cannot say. We see at a great distance a new world stirring from the ruins of your race, seeking its lost and legendary treasures, and they will be here, my son, safe in our keeping. When that time arrives, we shall come forward again and help revive your culture and your race. Perhaps, by then, you will have learned the futility of war and its strife, and after that time, certain of your culture and science will be returned to your race to begin anew. You, my son, are to return to the surface world with this message. Uh, okay, now I see why you said that. <laughs> it's, well, it, oh, are, are you going to? Oh, there's more. We, we, yeah, we, yeah, 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 yeah. We're good. Oh, my God. Well, I wanted to <laughs> remind you, because it, it has been a while since, um, w- one of my big life studies has been Hitler's study of the occult and how it related. And remember who Hitler thought, the, why he built the uh, city he was building, where he built it, and what his true uh, mission was. Because remember, there was a Norse race that we believe he is the Fomorians, who were the true blonde-haired, blue-eyed people who were prophesied to come and rule the world after we've obliterated it. What he wanted to do was go ahead and prepare the way. Uh, uh, go ahead and bring back the return so that we, we could... But in his mind, and who knows, <laughs> the Jews... Weren't they called like the Arianes or something like that? Yes, Arianas? Ariani. Yeah. And uh, just keep in mind who Hitler believed the true power that was returning was and the things keeping them back were the wars and stuff that the Jews were perpetrating. Don't know why he picked the Jews, except if you go back through the history of it, the Jewish God was in direct opposition the, to the Tawatha, the Fomoris, and the Aryans. Well, this is fun. I've n- I cannot believe I've never heard of this. I, it, which bugs me because I used to talk to this about you. Well, talk I never heard this. like these like passages. Yes, the actual diary entries. Well, there was a whole thing I sent you. Well, no, no, I agree with that. Like, no, what I'm no, I don't want to talk about it with you anymore. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris, because it gets better. With these closing words, our meeting seemed to an end. I stood for a moment as in a dream, but yet I knew this was reality, and for some strange reason, I bowed silently, either out of respect or humility. I don't know which. Suddenly, I was again aware that these two beautiful hosts who had brought me here were again at my side. This way, Admiral, motioned one. I turned once more before leaving and looked back toward the master. A gentle smile was etched on his delicate and ancient face. Farewell, my son, he spoke. Then he gestured with a lovely, slender hand a motion of peace, and our meeting was truly ended. Quickly, we walked back through the great door of the master's chamber and once again entered into the elevator. The door slid silently downward, and we were once again going upward. One of my hosts spoke again. We must now make haste, Admiral, as the Master desires to delay you no longer on your scheduled timetable, and you must return with his message to your race. I said nothing. All this was almost beyond belief, and once again my thoughts were interrupted as we stopped. I entered the room and was again with my radio man. He had an anxious expression on his face. As I approached, I said, It is all right, Howie. It is all right. The two beings motioned us toward the awaiting conveyance. We boarded and soon arrived back at the aircraft. The engines were idling, and we boarded immediately. The whole atmosphere seemed to change now with a certain air of urgency. After the cargo door was closed, the aircraft was immediately lifted by that unseen force until we reached an altitude of 2,700 feet. Two of the aircraft were alongside for some distance, guiding us on our return way. I must state here, the airspeed indicator registered no reading, yet we were moving along at a very rapid rate. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, again, with that, I wonder with the airspeed indicator... I don't think he's flying. I think they're just moving him. Right. Like, maybe the one on each side yeah. was, like, when you think of, like, magnetic force, yeah, just like, they whoop. propel, but in the middle is a, yeah. a huge force. Yeah. 2.15 hours, so 2 a.m. Yeah. A radio message comes through. We are leaving you now, Admiral. Your controls are free. Auf Wiedersehen. We watched for a moment, and the flugel rods disappeared into the pale blue sky. 
The aircraft suddenly fell as though caught in a sharp down downdraft for a moment. We quickly recovered her control. We do not speak for some time. Each man has his thoughts. Entry into the flight log continues. 220 hours. We were, again, uh, we were again over vast areas of ice and snow and approximately 27 minutes from base camp. We radio them. They respond. We report all conditions normal. Base camp expresses relief at our re-established contact. 300 hours. We land smoothly at base camp. I have a mission. Uh, end log entries. March 11th, 1947. So this is... This was in February, so a month later. I have just attended a staff meeting at the Pentagon. I have stated fully my discovery and the message from the master. All is duly recorded. The president has been advised. I am now detained for several hours, uh, six hours, 39 minutes to be exact. I'm interviewed intently by top security forces and a medical team. It was an ordeal. I am placed under strict orders via the national security provisions of the United States of America. I am ordered to remain silent in regard to all that I have learned. On behalf of humanity, incredible. I am... Reminded that I am a military man and that I must obey orders. 3-12-1956, so nine years later, final entry. These last few years elapsed since 1947 and have not been kind. I now make my final entry into this singular diary. In closing, I must state that I have faithfully kept with the matter secret as directed all these years. It has been completely against my values of moral right. Now I seem to, I seem to sense the long night coming on and the secret will not die with me. But as all Death. truth shall, it will triumph, and so it shall. This can be the only hope for mankind. I have seen the truth, and it has quickened my spirit and has set me free. I have done my duty toward the monstrous military-industrial complex. Now the long night begins to approach, but there shall not be an end. Just as the long night of the Arctic ends, the brilliant sunshine of truth shall come again. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd, I'd like to remind us all that Master has such a negative connotation, but... Truly, it means teacher. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's just like a, a Jedi master. Yeah, it's an honorific for a teacher who knows way more than you. Yeah, he, they're the master. Ha. Huh. Yep. And keep in mind, he just started flying, so a lot of people say he had snow snake, snow snow snake, sickness, snow snakeness, snow snakeness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he saw some cow koalas. No, he he <laughs> had, but he just started flying. He didn't have a chance to get snow sick. Especially when you see movies like Snowpiercer and those where they, they just go crazy yeah. well, from being out in the snow. And you're looking at like Snowpiercer, they're also traveling at 300 miles an hour with nothing to see. Yeah. yeah. You're covering such great distances and there's nothing. I don't know if you go snow sick after two hours when exactly. you start seeing actual things like colors and mountains. Mm -hmm. and again, with Antarctica, there are things that break up the monotony. We mm -hmm. know there are mountain ranges down there. Those exist. We know they exist. Yeah. We've seen them. Yeah. So like... I don't know if snow sickness is the right thing for him. I right. There's in, in two hours and he's checking equipment, you know, adjust, making adjustments. He's, he's very engaged with what he's doing. Yeah. And he's not like, again, he's, he's making his entries as you would like, yeah. Mm -hmm. What's happening. Uh, oil's a little rich. We fixed it. Continue. Like, yeah. It's like, yeah. Like talking about its engines, all that stuff. And then suddenly it's like the, yeah, I getting think I some turbulence moved up a little bit. So, this how did this book get? I mean, not how did his journal get released? Because either this is like the best fiction I've read in a while or heard about in a while, or like this guy lost his mind or he saw some shit. So supposedly this was found in his personal effects after he died, mm -hmm. um, and then was released by the guys who found it. Again, don't know if it's true or not. I'm just telling you, seems right. It feels right to me. Yeah, it feel, yeah. It has especially since. The people at the base camp, at, when this came out, confirmed that, yes, he did talk about it when he got there. Because he wasn't under strictures at the time. Yeah, he could talk about whatever the fuck he saw, which yeah. is crazy. Yeah. And he he was obsessed with getting this out. He, he he did talk about it. They admitted that they've seen some, you know, some strange shit. I mean, I'm down for this. Like, But he I, also has drawings. Yeah. He, he tried to, to draw like the land where it, he just happened to see it. Well, I was about to say, is it, I mean, we've had cave drawings of like what's looked like disc shaped objects and we're like yeah, it's ufos yeah and maybe it isn't maybe and it's discs, something from that's a va an advanced civilization that we just don't know about, about it. They, they call them flugel rods and you know a lot of times people say they see what looks like the rod the cigar box <laughs> things in the sky and that is about the time that the u.s did start it's you know where we do know that they were investigating any sort of ufo yeah well for him to say that they were 
there is a danger of aircraft invading from the poles, even though we knew we could not build a base there. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one I'm like, mm, he knew something was up. Mm-hmm. And that's all he really could say. Like, yeah. hey, it is dangerous. It is possible. It is possible, but what it is may not be Nazis. Well, mm-hmm. and, you, and you know what? You're thinking like, hey, you're going to, we live beneath you and you're destroying everything. The other side of that coin is we're not going to let you. I mean, again, or what happens up here doesn't affect them. So there's like, fuck, yeah. fuck each other up. We don't want you to die, but if you do, yeah. Well, I know people talk s- such crap about Hollow Earth, and I-, I hate talking about it and talking about what could potentially be there and, like, how the magnets run through and blah, blah, blah. Because even you've given me funny looks. When- but there were there there is, like, more things, like the two kids that said they couldn't get back home. Their skin was bluish colored. They said they lived beneath the Earth. And they could be cave people. I don't know. <laughs> But they had like these huge eyes. They just were different, right? And they, they oh, did. Oh, the green-skinned children. Yeah, yeah. They didn't well, have a good life because they just wanted to go home. Because well, up I here mean, was like hell for them. If you want to talk about, which we've done an episode, we did. I mean, we did a whole like mythology thing, and in the stories of the Tuath and the Fomorians, humans won and sent them back into the. Back into the earth, like the idea was that they didn't just disappear and eradicate completely. Well, because they were back- with each other, yeah, almost destroyed us, right? So they were sent back into the earth, and that's why they think like fairy circles are a way in which the fairy you fairies mm-hmm. can take you away and stuff like that. In old so Irish the Tuatha stories, think I- Ireland, UK, Scottish continent. The Fomores were the more Germanic ones, and then you had the Arianas who were the Celtic Viking. Kind of stayed a little bit out of it. But uh, the Tuatha were attacked by the Fomori, and the Tuatha had powerful weapons for the most part, made out of this uh, so like mercury substance. And then the Fomori started adopting mechanical weaponry yeah. after the humans, and then they beat. Well, the and Tuatha. they talk about like the four weapons, or yeah, even in that uh, journal entry, you talk about the weapons that they had, like yeah. these legendary the weapons, of Destiny, the Spear of Destiny, the, uh, ever, the, never, the Never Ending Cauldron, the Chalice of. Uh, the chalice of life, but it's whatever it's called in um, the biblical references. Yeah. The Holy Grail. The Holy Grail. Yeah. And then what's the other one? There's four there's, pieces. There's of the, the chalice, the cup, or the chalice, the cauldron, the, the spear. spear, and then the crown, I think. Is, is it a crown or a shield? Hold on. It's the one that hasn't been found. Although they think they found it because it. It's the sword, the spear. It's the sword, right, the spear, right, right. The, the cauldron, sword. and the stone of destiny. Yeah. The cauldron. I think the cauldron actually is supposed to be the Holy Grail as well. Yeah. So they they know they have the spear. The think, sword is I what? I think it's the sword and the stone. Yeah. Well, the sword is supposed to be the one that chose the English. Yeah. So all of these have, like, huge legends going way, way back. And if you put kings. them together, which is why Hitler was looking for them, he had found three of the four. And if you put them together, you become, like, the undisputed king ah. of the earth. Uh, king Kong. I found all seven Dragon Balls. Let's do this. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's the sword that we we haven't been able to. The sword, I think, is the one that's still missing because it was mm-hmm. the one that chose the kings of England, and then it Cause, was lost. Yeah, because we know Hitler had. Um, he even had the crystal skull. Yeah, it was found in an attic in Germany where he would stored some shit. Well, that is weird. That I've yeah. I mean, that's that's some balls to the wall good shit. I mean, I'm down for. Th- I want to 100% believe it. I want to 100% fun. believe it. It is fun. I, I, yeah. The hollow earth thing to me is just a little, like, I get where, I get the idea of it, but the idea that there's, like, a subset Well, because of some it. people think it's reptilians who live in hollow earth, and how do we know it's not? Right. But. But if these people, like, like Atlantis and, like, all these other places that are on earth that we've heard about, mm-hmm. like, these advanced, like, civilizations, yeah. the pyramids, stuff well, like think that. think about this huge. Un, un, like way underground uh, forest that they just found in China because of a sinkhole opened up and they're like, my God, it's a whole ancient forest in there. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like it. It could be. It could be. It's Especially, a mystery. Like, I feel like we, we aren't the explorers here. We're the explored. <laughs> We're like the dumbasses. Like our, our version of it. Like everybody else mm-hmm. has figured shit like out. Like how we watch you know, monkeys figuring out tools and stuff. They're like, oh, look at them. Yeah, but we also like to think that. We also want to think that we're not the only things here. And it's, I don't know if it's a God thing or there has to be something better than us. Yeah, because we're awful. People are awful. But they're, I mean, 
I don't, I'm not going to say whether I believe it or not, but I will say that there doesn't necessarily have to be anything better than us. That we could be as good as it fucking gets. Yeah. yeah. Good but job, us. Maybe I, the other things are worse. Yeah. Maybe we rose to the top. <laughs> hey, get but it. I want to say that guy sounds pretty legit. Like, that he shit does. sounds legit and he as has fuck. a really legitimate history. Like, it's yeah. not like he's been brought up for insubordination. But again, if this shit isn't. Up. If this isn't real, it doesn't matter how good his history is. It's just something that uses his name. Yeah. Because and that, it's good. And that is the sad part is like the other question is like maybe they found a journal and maybe he was writing fiction about like what he did. It could be that he was writing a, a book or a short story in the first place or they took it and ran with it. Like yeah. maybe they did find like some valleys and forests <laughs> and they just... That all did exist, but then the whole like, added to it a little added bit. to a little added a little flavor, like a little salt bay flavor to it. <laughs> like I don't know, a little sauce. I would like to believe it's mm-hmm. true. I don't know. I want to believe it's true. But that's pretty good. Yeah, it's one of those things that nobody's really heard about, and I'm like, this is amazing, and everyone yeah. needs to hear about it. It's great. And now think about what's hitting the news is the uh, archaeologists down there have found these huge um, stone arches mm-hmm. covered in. Some kind of writing. It's yeah. not hieroglyphics. They say, but they, well, again, even the Pentagon is admitted they have UFOs or they have craft that we did not make. Right. We may be, we are not they. So they may have made it and we may have grabbed it or dug it up or whatever. Because, right. I mean, even Bob Lazar said that there were uh, craft that were recovered from archaeological digs while he was working on their mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. propulsion. So, again, if that's true... Maybe they've been around for a while. Well, Maybe someone got drunk and wrecked that shit. Yeah. I also like to go back to, you know, Christopher Columbus crossing the ocean blue in 1492. And in his captain's log is, huh, there were some really weird lights under the water that <laughs> shot out and then some kind of moving vehicle. Well, they know, like, USOs, like, even when you talk to uh, Lieutenant Fraber and the Tic Tac UFOs and Go Fast, they go under the water. Yeah. We have film of them, or video of it happening which is insanity yeah i mean even on expedition x they have an entire like episode and i'm like this is legit like you can tell but like they're looking and they see what looks like some sort of just, uni- unidentified object yeah. and then they start seeing lights in the water and it's apparently like, it's pretty common off the west coast of the that, u.s and that's where they were it was and, in like towards like in san diego Canada, yeah prince edward island yeah because the Pacific's kind of creepy. There's no reason. There's a reason why it's called Pacific Pacific Rim and not Atlantic Rim. Well, and the fact that there's this huge dragon circle between us and Japan, where nothing goes into it, it's just completely dead ocean. Like what? What? What happened down there? Yeah. <laughs> What's going on in that area? Well, Megalodon. Ooh, it makes you just feel <laughs> like your mortality sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. There's a lot Ooh. of shit I won't know the answer to when I die. I mean, I have always said I have yeah. comfort in the fact that I am a minuscule. I think mil- when we die, nanosecond in the world, so much information is going to hit us all at once. I hope so. And, but at that point, we won't even care to have known it because we always knew it. I think our spirit cells have always known the answers. Speaking of which, there was this joke on Reddit talking about like the queen reincarnating. and it's like you go from the Queen of England to like just some random dude on the street now. It's like, can you imagine? Yeah. Good, good joke. It wasn't like a joke. It was like a meme, but it was talking about like it was a picture of the Queen of England and then it was like somebody that she had fucked with or something like that. I was like, hey, I don't know. And just in the idea of resurrection, in insurrection, resurrection. Maybe she's tired of being the queen and she wants to come back as something different. Yeah. Well, your karmic cycles supposedly are supposed to teach you what you didn't learn in all of your past lives. So hers will probably be something humble. Yeah. I don't know. We don't know the queen. She's. It was just a lot in her, but she definitely seemed to be a little, a little racist. A little I'm racist. Just I'm going to cut this off, but she seemed a little racist. Yeah. Well, I have learned something new today. It's fun. That was scary. That's cool, though. Operation High Jump's cool. And mm-hmm. then, like, there's a link to the missing 411 where they think it's the flugel rides that are just coming, taking. Because if you'll notice, a lot of the missing 411 are very Germanic people. Yeah. You'll get a lot of uh, the darker tones getting <laughs> taken. And that may be just because mm-hmm. a lot of. Here, we don't have a lot of Hispanic well, people, black people that hike a lot. I was about to yeah. say, they're smart. But here's the thing. That's why I don't want to go hiking because, you know, Loper, hello, I'm this German. I don't want to risk it. But there's a theory that that's what's happening is the flugelrides are showing up and taking the people back. Which is why you don't hear anything, you don't see anything, you never find a body, they're just gone. Because they've just been taken home. Mm-hmm. Well, if I can bring my wife, uh, 
<laughs> and my cats. My wife and my cats. My friends. And my, yeah, you know what? Yeah, they're not going to take me because I'd be like, one more thing. And another thing. <laughs> well, that was. Listen, real quick. Listen, real quick. <laughs> well, alrighty. That was, that was interesting. It's we're, fun. We're back. Enjoy. You like, know, next week we can go back to the crazy real crime. Oh, we're gonna. Well, mine's mine's kind of it's real crime. Becky's is dig do the ditches and burn. No, no, it just talk about the witch of Warwickshire. No, yeah, cool. I love it. I was like, oh, this is spooky. Witches aren't real. Why you gotta be like that? I I do this with my wife all the time. Why do you have to be like he that? He flies in on a flugel rod and then wants to tell you witches aren't real. I know. I was about to say like we're talking about this guy. I'm just saying they built the flugel rods. I want to see you curse me. I mean, fuck you. So we're done. Yeah. That's... <laughs> oh no, you curse him with a fuck. Okay. Oh, yeah. Listen. And so when witches. you have sex tonight, remember Becky cursed you. So don't don't think about that, please. Who just wake up? Oh, it was Becky's fault. I'm sorry. <laughs> Casey's gonna be like, this doesn't ever happen. It was all Becky. <laughs> Hey. Oh, God. Just Shania Twain and a dragon oh, voice God. in the background as you go. That's the best. Yeah. Let's go, girls. Listen, that's how I play my Valorant. All righty. And my new name is Sergeant Fanny Pack Magoo. <laughs> Sergeant Fanny Pack Magoo. Too many letters. All right. We love y'all. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. <laughs>